Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. This is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Good evening. Thanks for joining us on air and online. I'm Brianna Venosi in for Mary Alice Williams. We continue to remind you that our studio is closed, but we will be here every day to bring you the latest news and information. Well, as expected, the number of positive COVID-19 cases shot up over the weekend. As we left you on Friday, the state was reporting 890 positive cases. Today, that number stands at 2,844, an increase of nearly 1,000 just overnight with 27 fatalities. According to the State Department of Health, the outbreak is now in all 21 counties, all corners of the state. Governor Murphy over the weekend toughened his social distancing requirements with a mandated stay at home order that means no gatherings of any kind, groups of zero. You should only be leaving your home for essential needs, he said, like food or medicine, or if you've been deemed an essential worker. The governor said today it's a relatively short-term sacrifice for a better long-term outcome. This as the state opened its second FEMA-backed COVID-19 testing site in Homedale. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan was there. There is a demand. There's a lot of people who want testing. Supervising physician Mark Merlin watched people drive through New Jersey's second pop-up test site and get swabbed for the coronavirus at the PNC Bank Arts Center just off exit 116 on the Garden State Parkway. Such a crush of cars lined up, officials decided they'd hit capacity and closed off the entrance only a half hour after the facility opened. Another overcapacity crowd in Paramus caused the coronavirus test site at Bergen Community College to shut down early for the fourth day in a row. That as the state top 2,800 positive cases today. I'm sure we'll have a reaction, oh my lord, that's a lot of positives. On the other hand, the more data we have at our disposal, the better and more equipped we are to be able to break the back of this virus. Um, as we begin, as I said, more rigorous collection statewide, we are act in actuality getting a clearer and better sense of how far the coronavirus has already spread. We expect, as I said, these numbers to continue to rise. Both test sites showed what Governor Murphy called a pent-up demand for testing as New Jersey residents self-isolate during the state lockdown that started Saturday night. And the state's working to coordinate a patchwork of test results from hospitals, private and state labs. As the number of tests ramps up dramatically, New Jersey's Homeland Security chief today ordered more than 60 private processing labs to report directly their COVID-19 tests test results to the State Department of Health. Hospitals hope to stave off the anxiously anticipated surge of patients. If people start coming to the emergency department in mass amounts, then the waits will be longer. We don't want that. This is why having testing centers outside the emergency department grounds is a great idea. While people waited in line at the state's two drive through test sites, counties set up their own testing facilities that operate by appointment only at Kane University for Union County and here in Secaucus for Hudson County. Hudson Regional Hospital became the county's COVID-19 test site today with enough test kits and protective gear to handle 200 people a day. For now, we have enough for the testing process. And of course, you know, we're, we're always looking for more because we want to continue to provide this valuable service to the community. People must be county residents, show symptoms like fever, coughing and shortness of breath, and they must first call for an appointment. Hudson executive Tom DeGees doesn't want to copy the state's drive-through model. We don't want uh, people to you know, get in their car and drive here, uh, wait in line for a, a, a good period of time, and then be told at the end of the line, we can help you. The objective, reduce stress on people and hospitals. In Secaucus, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News.
And Governor Murphy also issued an executive order today suspending all elective surgeries. It's another effort to preserve essential equipment and hospital capacity. In yet another bold move, the state attorney general announced today about 1,000 nonviolent and low-level offenders will be released from county jails to help stop the spread of COVID-19. The announcement came after Governor Murphy spoke one-on-one -on -one with the president, pleading again for direct cash assistance, more of those pop-up field hospitals, and critical equipment. The governor says the state is already taking aggressive action to stem the spread of the coronavirus. Social distancing works and slowing the spread of COVID-19 only happens if we take steps to protect ourselves and others. So when we hear of people hosting parties or other ga gatherings, we will not take it lightly. We will ask law enforcement to cite them for their irresponsible behavior, and the Attorney General uh, will have more on that in a few minutes. And before I continue, to all school districts, we have received your questions, we continue to receive them, and we need you to continue your food service operations and to provide meals to the students who need them. The reality is that schools will likely, we've not made an official decision, but they were overwhelmingly likely remain closed for a long and extended period of time and we must ensure that every student is taken care of. In a world of limited resources and manpower, we're going to be, and by the way, we've been as aggressive on testing as any American state. Uh, we've been as uh, out there uh, expanding, as we predicted, testing uh, dramatically. We are going to come to a moment sooner than later, I would guess, uh, as it relates to manpower, healthcare workers in particular, uh, PPE, the actual specimen collecting equipment that is needed to take the intake. Um, we're going to come to sort of forks in the road between, I'm, I'm again I'm beyond my pay grade, Commissioner, but between uh, resources and manpower dedicated to testing versus resources and manpower dedicated to care. Uh, and that's a balance we're going to have to get right. Uh, and as much as we want to continue to be a leader in testing in our country, the fact of the matter is in a limited uh, resource world, and a limited manpower world, we may have to tilt the machine. With the number of COVID-19 cases only expected to grow, health care workers are sounding an alarm, begging in some cases for help with a dire shortage of personal protective equipment. It's known as PPE. These are the things like surgical gowns, gloves, face shields, and those N95 masks you've been hearing about. Well, late last night, Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, the epicenter of New Jersey's outbreak, tweeted for donations to help buy supplies. The hospital says it's now down to just a four-day reserve of those critical N95 face masks and completely out of disposable gowns. Senior correspondent David Cruz has been looking into the situation at Holy Name and elsewhere. So how did we get to this point? Brianna, that's a great question. You know, this has been going on since January. There were reports of shortages even then. And really, there, there's two main reasons. And the first one, we have to blame ourselves because people have been uh, buying up these N95 masks in particular in bulk like it was toilet paper, you know? And the fact is, the Surgeon General says that these N95 masks aren't really effective for personal use, like out in the street or at home or whatever, because A, folks don't know how to use them because it's not just a mask, it's sort of a respirator as well. And so they, they really need training on how to use them. And then secondly, when they handle them, they could just be contaminating them as well. So, you know, people who have bought all of these in bulk, they might as well be using a newspaper to cover their faces. The, the, um, the Surgeon General says, look, wash your hands, stay at home, stay away from people. That's the best way to do that. And Our secondly is price gouging. Mm. Uh, a lot of uh, companies have been just jacking up the prices. And so that means that hospitals and nursing homes and wherever there are people who need these can't buy as many. But is anyone stepping up to help? State leaders, federal leaders? Yeah, well, the, the state, uh, uh, all they can do is request from the federal government. We've talked to uh, Alex Altman. He is at the governor's press office, and they've said that they've reached out and asked the federal government 
to release this strategic reserve of sorts that they have in order to get these supplies to the states. They gave me a number. They got 18,000 of these N95 masks, wow. and they've said repeatedly that is a fraction of their actual requests. You know, a lot they, of people... They've also asked the, they've also asked the federal government um, to release... Um, to order these companies through the National Production Act to get companies to make more of these things. The president so far has invoked it, but he has not activated it. Very quickly, what can people do to help? Everyone's asking. Yeah, um, uh, you mentioned uh, Holy Name Hospital. There is a website, helpholyname.org, which is a way for, for folks to reach out and find out more. There's a group, I have to say, in Pequonic, they're called Quilting for a Cause, NJ. They usually make quilts for homeless people. They've now switched to making masks uh, for hospitals and so on. And even Harbor Freight, uh, which sells all this kind of equipment, they've stopped selling it, and they're giving it away to hospitals with 24-hour emergency rooms. Hospital help at harborfreight.com is an email to write to to get more information. All right. Thanks, David. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Bree. Newark clamped down on its residents over the weekend in an attempt to slow the spread of coronavirus before it engulfs its neighborhoods. The mayor demanding residents in three zones to shelter in place, an aggressive approach to containment, but one he hopes will track any spread more effectively. Correspondent Michael Hill explains. This is a coronavirus hot zone in Newark's North Ward. Two more are in the South Ward. City agencies use the same technology to map crime to map clusters of coronavirus. They put dots on a map for each infection by zip code and block. And then on the same map, they overlay dots for each quarantined person or presumptive infection. And we did see a, a, a couple of patterns there uh, that we became concerned about. And we said maybe we should uh, put a stricter uh, kind of uh, regulations in place in these areas than the governor has done around the entire city. We want you to stay inside unless it's an emergency, unless you have to go get food, unless you have to go get medicine, unless you have to go to the doctor. That's it. We don't want you to come out and go to the park, walk your dog. We don't want you to do any of those things. I'm standing in one of the hot zones right now and people are going back and forth as if they never heard the mayor's message about why he declared three hot zones in Newark. I interviewed the mayor in the Office of Emergency Management. Literally right across Clinton Avenue, a convenience store was a popular destination. What brings you out today? Uh, just enjoying the weather. I'm going up to uh, Clinton Avenue to 1650 to give a message. I'm good to go. I ain't worried really about the vibe too much. What are you going to get? Some noodles, soda, and juice. Good. You know, the mayor has declared this a hot zone. Are you? Yes, I heard. What do you think of that? We have to do what you got to do. You know, to keep us safe. Yeah, well, I feel it's necessary to get food, milk for my children. They got to deliver it to the door, were they? What about enforcement in this case in some of these hot zones? Um, uh, how is that being enforced? What are police doing about it? Well, our police officers are out, are, are out there. Obviously, they're not trying to arrest people, but they're out there uh, communicating with people. They have the sirens on. They have the, uh, you know, the, the PA system going. We've been communicating to, to other folks to help us. And I think, you know, relatively, the community has been, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, obeying the, 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 the restrictions. Police report issuing no summonses and making no arrests for hot zone violations. The mayor says as more testing takes place in Newark, he anticipates more infections and more quarantines and more hot zones. Unfortunately, those boundaries may grow, not get smaller. You know, they may grow. You know, it may come to a point where we have to say, because, listen, this virus has no boundaries. It, it doesn't respect boundaries. It goes on. And then some of us are not uh, taking it as seriously as we need to. Newark is now reassessing the mapping of COVID-19 to track the containment. Michael Hill, NJTV News. New Jersey has more than 240,000 special education students and much of their curriculum relies on intensive, individualized, one-to-one, face-to-face learning. And meeting those needs through remote schooling is proving to be an uphill task for teachers, students, and parents. Joanna Ganga spoke with one family who's coming up with creative strategies to make sure their special needs children don't get left behind. He gets occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, 
And obviously, since we're home, he's not getting. It's not the one-on-one -on -one contact that he would normally get at school. John is an eight-year-old with cerebral palsy and autism. At school, he works one-on-one -on -one with an aide all day. But like so many other kids with disabilities, the closing of schools means John doesn't get the daily services he depends on. Neither do his brother and sister, each with different needs. I have a typical six-year-old and then a, a three-year-old who's also preschool disabled. So it's difficult to try and teach these three kids and also maintain work and some sense of normalcy in their lives. Tully is a speech therapist herself who's still working remotely while schools are closed. She says most days her family is in, quote, survival mode. And while she's getting remote support from John's teachers, she now has to be the physical support that he requires. We reached out to the Department of Education to ask how the state was supporting this vulnerable population during school closures. They said, quote, teachers know their students the best and they're providing instruction in a number of ways that best meet the students' needs, whether it's electronic or on paper or face-to-face -face through the internet. Meeting the needs of children with disabilities is always a challenge and our educators, service providers and families are working together to provide the best instruction and services possible in these difficult times. Tully had the opportunity to bring a part-time aide into their home to work with John, but he has other medical complications and bringing in the extra help puts him at greater risk of getting coronavirus. Ultimately, the decision that I made was to keep the services as long as I can to help with my mental well-being and give me some type of support. Support to allow Tully to work with her six-year-old Julia, who she worries will be most impacted by all of this. I thought about retaining her next year. I've thought about getting a tutor to work with her every day once everything does come back because she will, she will fall behind. The Tully's just learned the aide now has a sick child. There's no telling when she'll be back. So for now, Regina's handling it all by herself. In Verona, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJTV News. The coronavirus pandemic is upending every facet of life. Major milestones are being postponed or canceled altogether. We told you earlier about that mandatory stay at home order, no gatherings of any kind. For brides to be, this viral outbreak has become the wedding guest no one invited. Raven Santana met with couples and planners about options moving forward. I would be lying if I told you that wasn't a moment I was hysterically crying about the entire thing at one point. I mean, who can really say? Uh, I was supposed to get married, but a global pandemic uh, postponed the entire event. Megan Miller was ready to walk down the aisle this Friday and marry the love of her life after spending about a year planning the big event. So I got my veil, um, and then my fiance and I, we obviously have like so much personalized stuff. My dog has a, a whole wedding outfit. Those plans changed when Governor Murphy ordered residents to stay at home and banned all gatherings, forcing Miller to postpone her wedding till the summer at the earliest. A June 28th wedding may still be too. Wedding day coordinator and founder of Weddings Made Simple, Carla Friday, says Miller joins other brides in the state who are left emotionally and financially drained by the coronavirus pandemic. The average cost in New Jersey is about thirty-five dollars to $40,000 all in. So I can understand everybody's stress. Friday says while the future may look bleak, she is urging brides not to cancel their weddings and instead to take a closer look at any contracts they have with vendors. A lot of this is confusing and it's unknown. And again, the, your best interest is to postpone and not cancel so you don't run into problems with your vendor's contract or lack of availability um, or additional costs that may be incurred from trying to cancel. From a business perspective, Friday says she and many of those same vendors are also feeling the financial hardships of canceling events. Got zero weddings because they've all been moved. Miller says while she's heartbroken over the delay, she's trying to keep things in perspective. It's not about the celebration. It's about uh, the marriage between two people that love each other. In Scotch Plains, Raven Santana, NJTV News.
Lawmakers in D.C. are closing in on a much-needed stimulus package for American workers and businesses. But there are some sticking points that need to be worked out. Rhonda Schaffler joins us with that and the day's top business stories. Brianna, desperately needed help for the U.S. economy may be finalized in Washington if and only if lawmakers put political partisanship aside. For the second time, the Senate failed to pass a massive economic stimulus bill. Negotiations continue. The head of the NJBIA, Michelle Sikirka, has this plea for federal lawmakers. Whatever is passed, make it easy for small businesses. Well, they need access and they need ease in order to um, be able to tap into those programs. The challenge oftentimes with federal programs is there's a lot of red tape. And so businesses are immediately kind of thrown back. I, you know, I don't have those 200 receipts for this. It's difficult for me to prove this type of loss. A few updates for businesses following the governor's news conference earlier today. The state is going to crack down on non-essential businesses that stay open, and it continues to go after more companies for price gouging. Add the Port Authority to the long list of businesses and entities seeking federal assistance. The Port Authority wants $1.9 billion in federal money following the lead of NJ Transit, which is also seeking federal emergency assistance. Within the last 24 hours, several New Jersey companies have made medical supply donations. That includes Prudential Financial, based in Newark. It donated 153,000 face masks and respirators to the state. Prudential had those items stockpiled since the 9-11 attacks. And Kenilworth-based Merck has donated a half million face masks to New York City. Big industrial companies, that includes 3M, Honeywell and General Electric, they're increasing production of their medical supplies. Also, automakers are looking into whether they can make ventilators. It will take a while, though, for these supplies to actually move their way into the market. The Federal Reserve launching more programs to try to support financial markets. The Fed will continue to buy more debt. That's government debt, mortgage debt, and now debt from companies. Turning our attention to Wall Street, let's take a look at the closing numbers for stocks. I'm Rhonda Schapler, and those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by Junior Achievement of New Jersey, announcing its annual Business Hall of Fame J.A. Laureate Legacies at the East Brunswick Hilton on June 9th. Event details online at janj.org. If you have any questions or concerns about the coronavirus, its symptoms or how to treat it, you can call New Jersey's coronavirus hotline. The number's on your screen, 1-800-222-1222 or text NJCOVID to 898-211. And you can find all the latest reporting and resources for tackling the coronavirus, like fact sheets, a list of symptoms and phone numbers to call, on a special section of our website. Just head to njtvnews.org slash coronavirus for updated information. Tomorrow on NJTV News, keeping our first responders safe. What happens when one or many test positive? And a quick note, our anchor Mary Alice Williams is tending to a serious health challenge in her family unrelated to the COVID-19 virus. We wish her family well. We'll continue to keep you updated online at njtvnews.org. I'm Brianna Venosi. For our entire team, stay safe. We thank you for being here. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than a hundred years. PSE&G, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the men and women who keep the Garden State growing. Business leaders. 
the caretakers of our historic landmarks and the custodians of our public safety. The people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered. I've got cancer. I've got cancer treatments you won't find anywhere else. I've got cancer researchers closing in on a cure. I've got cancer, but I've also got a nurse navigator who's there every step of the way. I've got cancer and I'm fighting it. We're fighting it at New Jersey's only NCI designated comprehensive cancer center. If cancer comes into your life, you'll find the most comprehensive care at RWJ Barnabas Health and Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. PSE&G is building New Jersey's clean energy future. We're working to protect our network against extreme weather, expanding and upgrading transmission lines, and modernizing our natural gas system by installing new, more durable underground pipes. At PSE&G, our goal is to make sure you have the safe, reliable energy you need to power your life now and into the future. I'm Kayla, and this is what I work for, to teach him to protect her, and to take care of me, too. I need health insurance that does the same, that makes things easier for my schedule, so I can focus on what matters. This is my life, and this is how Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey works for me, and him, and her. <laughs> 